We have Ms. Pat uh, Tratina working with us right now because the manager has to take a phone call. So next we have housing affordability and partnerships. Yes, ma'am. Once again, this will be a joint presentation between several, several stakeholders. So we will have Eric Lebo, Greg Revels, and Sheila Miner, and we will be this is a build off of a work session that the board heard a few weeks ago. So there was pretty data heavy the last time. So we'll be providing some additional information about seniors and the housing stock. We'll touch on Glenwood Farms, which is an active priority project for all of our county agencies. We'll discuss some strategies to help buy down the cost of housing in the county and a focus on our own workforce opportunities. And then we'll discuss how our land use policies can also help inform this. So I will ask the first presenter, Sheila Miner, to come on up and we'll get started. Thank you, Ms. Tina. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. So today to discuss with you some of the trends in housing affordability and the partnerships and programs that the county is looking at to address our community's housing needs. Much of the data that I'm going to present to you through the, first, through the first section of this presentation comes from the Partnership for Housing Affordability's Richmond Regional Housing Framework Data Update, which was published earlier this week. And as Mr. Tina alluded, this continues a discussion that we started with the board in an October work session, whereby we discussed some of the the workforce housing challenges that we have in the county, and we discussed income of our workforce, both those who are county employees and those who are private sector employees, and the gaps between earnings for those particular positions and the income necessary to afford housing in the county. To carry on from that initial discussion on our workforce, we're going to talk about a few other groups who are challenged in the area of affordable housing. And the first of those for, for discussion today is our senior population. Um, seniors represent a group that's facing challenges finding housing in their community. And some of these challenges are just because of the increase in the senior population that we've seen as a region. The Henrico experienced a 6,600 person increase in the senior population between 2016 and 2020. And the majority of this growth was among seniors who were the head of households, as you see in that first tan line, and then also those who are living alone in non-family arrangements. This growth in senior population is not limited to Henrico County and is a direct result of the aging baby boomer population that have crossed the threshold into the 65 and years and older population. Um, as you see in this slide, the increase in number of senior households that are aging in place because the purple, the largest percentage of increase in the region has been those 65 years and older who are homeowners. Throughout our presentation today, you're going to hear us discuss the two sides of housing affordability, a, a demand side, which talks about the ability of individuals and families to afford housing, and also a supply side, which is, as it in, indicates, the supply of affordable housing in the county and the area. Senior housing and the trends that we are seeing in seniors, as demonstrated by this slide, impact both sides of, of the equation in some way. And that is because seniors who are aging in place are, are not turning over affordable units that would be available to younger homeowners because they typically have been a source of affordable housing in our area. And then also those same seniors may be looking to downsize into more affordable units as they find any financial difficulties on fixed incomes. I'm going to talk about another population that, that faces in the, um, affordable housing challenges, and that is our independent living population or people with independent living difficulties. The census defines independent living difficulties as the presence of mental, physical, or emotional problems resulting in difficulty doing errands alone, such as shopping or visiting the doctor. And in Hyreco County has seen an increase of about 665 individuals with independent living difficulties between 2016 and 2020. Most of this growth has been among that same senior population we just discussed, but also the 35 to 64 year age range is also seeing major increases as well. You can see the overwhelming majority of those 
with independent living difficulties are occupy, currently occupying owner-occupied housing, which may or may not meet their individual challenges and needs. May I ask a question? Yes. Um, so this this increase is obviously the baby boomers getting getting older, but in past years, as we have uh, population that 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 ages, it's not a new thing. It's not. People get get older. It, it, it happens every year. So with that going on, is it that the problems didn't? I don't know how to say this properly. Problems were not as prevalent in the past, is that because most of the time they were brought in to extended families and that's not happen happening now? I think it's a, a combination of characteristics. I don't pretend to be the expert, so I'm going to allow anyone who wants to come and tap me on the shoulder to, to respond to that as well. But it's, it's the changing demographics of how we, I, I guess, interact with senior populations that we aging in place is much more of an emphasis right now. Again, this is the baby boomer generation, so it's just by sheer numbers, there are more of them than there are in some of the other generation cohorts we have coming through the, as on a na national basis. So it, it is not, to, to answer your question, Mr. Brandon, it's, it's not a new problem, but we seem to have a trend that's pushing the problem a little more heavily than it has been in the past. Thank you. If I may, the concern is it that they, you mentioned this, that they're not moving out of their house that they've had for many years. They're aging in place in their house. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons we worked on the, um, the care, uh, care vans, I mean, care service, you know, the on demand, care on demand service, mm -hmm. um, because they wanted to stay at home partly because it was less, cost less and um, they could take care of themselves, and they didn't want to move into, like, an assisted living facility. But obviously, in, in particularly my district, I've seen several cases of assisted living facilities being built. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of them now. So I'm wondering, I mean, the ones that have been built are for assisted living. They're not nursing homes. Um, and so I, th I think the market has shown that they are thinking about moving out. <laughs> into an assisted living facility because recently we've had those built. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, what that is. But I also know that there are certain types of insurance that will cover an aid in your home, but not your assisted living or assisted living, but will do a nursing home. So I think it might involve insurance too. I don't know if there's been any... Mr. Lebo is shaking his head. So, I mean, he might have in some answers to some of this, so... With the housing part of it, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I was just going to add that the um, the cost to get into some of the facilities may present barriers to people with limited incomes. Mm -hmm. So even though there may be more facilities being built, we have mm -hmm. lower income seniors that can't afford to purchase in those mm -hmm. particular communities. In addition, they may have the ability to receive services that they may need to live in their home. At home. But because they're on limited incomes, they may not be able to do the maintenance and the upkeep. Um, because there may not be other options out there for them. And that's, that's Oops, the sorry. point. I think that is the point. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay. So, so to move away a little bit from our, our demand and talking about the, the populations that are um, in need of affordable and, and workforce housing in the county, I want to talk a little bit about supply and what trends are impacting the supply of affordable housing in the county. And this is not a slide that is new to the board, and it is illustrating the median home sales price over the last four years. And as you can see, Again, no surprise that Henrico County's medium home sales price continues to increase to where we are north of 365,000. We hit our, our high in May of 2022 at the high of 365,000 for a median home price in Henrico County. From 2017 to 2022, the median home and price in the county had increased by 67%. I'm going to break down that statistic a little more to talk about the demographics and how they pertain to affordable housing. And in this chart, you see a comparison of new construction, which is that red line, 
versus the median home price of resale homes or existing homes. And the affordability of resale homes compared to new construction has often made them the first step in the road to home ownership. But since the start of the pandemic, the median resale home price has risen above 300,000 mark and in June reached a high of 371, 250 dollars. New construction is not focusing on affordability. You can see there's a significant gap and that average is about $89,000 in the value of new construction as a median home sale price versus resale values. Supply of available housing stock continues to impact the market. We wanted to give you an update on the months of available inventory. And as you can see, before the pandemic, inventory typically sat about two to four months, meaning that it would take two or more months to sell at the then current prices for housing on the market. A healthy level of supply, supply has said to be five or six months worth, but in recent years, the region has been below that, which indicates a very strong seller's market. Updating this slide as it goes through June of 22, recent indicators through the end of October have shown that even though there are trends impacting our housing market, such as the increase in, in mortgage rates and the perception of a tightening of the economy, we still these, see these inventories hovering at about the one month mark. So that piece has not eased quite yet. The average, yes. <clears throat> I don't wanna be, um... I guess we could speculate that that will likely change as interest rates go up. We just don't know, you know, what that change will be. It ha you haven't seen it yet. We have not seen it yet. Got it's it. definitely an interesting market out there on all, all fronts. We've concentrated on home ownership, but we wanted to speak also to the rental market as well, because again, as no surprise to the board, we still continue to see challenges in the rental market because rents have increased just as our median home prices. On this chart, you will see that that blue line represents the nominal or actual dollar rents over the course of, since the beginning before the pandemic in 2019. The red line is adjusted for inflation, since inflation has become an increasing factor in our numbers. And even with that inflation adjustment, you see that our rents are increasing on a real dollar price point, which has impacted the ability of um, our populations to afford housing in Henrico and the Richmond area. A few takeaways before I turn it over to the podium to Mr. Revels. I want to summarize these points. That home prices over $300,000 have made it hard for renters to make the transition to home ownership. They face challenges from increasing rents, which exacerbate the problem, making it difficult for these potential homeowners to save up for down payments. The gap between the typical workforce income and the earnings needed to afford a home continues to increase. And in 2020, there were, was an over 12,000 difference in the income needed to afford a median home price and the typical renter income. And lastly, the supply of affordable housing continues to lag the demand, particularly for workforce, senior, and disabled populations, as we just described. In 2018, there remained a rental shortage of over 12,000 units for household make, households making less than 80% of the average median income in the region. Actually, that was a county statistic. Be happy to answer any questions before I turn it over to Mr. Revels regarding for an update on Glenwood Farms. Any questions from members of the board? Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Manager, and Chief uh, Tritina. Um, I'm here to bring you an update on Glenwood Farms, uh, which, uh, and, and to share with you some um, unanticipated uh, arranged things that have happened since last year when we last talked to you uh, about the need for a rental inspections program at this apartment complex. But to get that started, oops, the wrong way. So get, to get that started, and for members of the audience that may not be familiar with this property, Glenwood Farms is a 26-acre community with 294 apartment uh, buildings that were built in 1948, and the property is now owned by a company called Apex Glenwood 
Virginia LLC um, that acquired the property in February of 2018. And you may recall that in 2018, we had uh, initiated a comprehensive inspection program for all apartment complexes across the county uh, based on our experiences out of Essex Village uh, and the conditions that existed at that complex. And Glenwood rose to the top of the list as a uh, complex that was the most stressed of all the 177 other complexes that we inspected over the course of the next two years. Um, so we ended up bringing uh, Glenwood to your attention in September of 2021, um, based on the, the previous three years' experience doing inspections, finding hundreds of uh, building code violations, zoning code violations um, across the property, mostly due to exterior inspections that we had conducted, uh, along with a few inspections that were the result of complaints filed by some of the tenants about the conditions in their buildings. And you'll recall when we uh, presented this to you in September of 21. Uh, that there were numerous uh, serious health and safety violations on the property that threatened uh, the livelihood of the tenants. That resulted, resulted in you adopting uh, a rental inspection district ordinance specific to Glenwood Farms, which gave us the authority to then go in and inspect the interior of the dwelling units uh, for their conditions and compliance with the Virginia uh, Building Code. Uh, we were able to successfully uh, initiate that program. Uh, we conducted uh, inspections in 29 units, which we were capped on our initial inspections by the legislation to no more than 10% of the total number of units on the property, which was 29. Uh, and the findings from those inspections were that every unit that we inspected, we encountered violations, some very serious violations um, that were cited to the owner and have did, did not get corrected, but then resulted in a petition for an injunction uh, that we filed with the circuit court on May 6 of 2022. Um, since that time, we've also received a number of um, uh, inquiries uh, and opportunities to inspect additional units other than those 29 via tenant assertions that have filed that were filed by the tenants against the landlord for not maintaining the property. Uh, as well as eviction hearings. Once the eviction moratorium from COVID was lifted, um, the owner started filing unlawful detainer cases with the court, which initiates the eviction process. And those tenants were coming forward to us uh, with concerns about their units as a potential defense against those unlawful detainers uh, via a breach of contract by the owner for not maintaining the property. So we've seen, in addition to our own uh, cases that we've initiated from the rental inspections program, the tenants are coming forward with their own assertions, putting their money in escrow in the court, and then calling on us to facilitate that effort. And it's actually uh, been very successful in terms of uh, assisting those tenants. In one case, uh, a tenant filed an assertion back in either March or April of this year. Uh, her rents were abated all the way through the end of September uh, for the uh, owner failing to maintain the unit. Um, we did participate in testifying, presenting evidence to the court in that case. Um, and she ended up, uh, like I said, with her rents being abated all the way through the end of September. Her attorney's fees, she had a pro bono attorney. The attorney's fees were paid uh, by Apex uh, for that, as well as her unit was rehabilitated. And uh, she got all new appliances, uh, and the violations that we had cited were all corrected as a result of that process. Unfortunately, Apex still has not provided us with a comprehensive or viable game plan uh, for rehabilitating the property uh, and correcting all the, the violations and concerns that we've been finding. <coughs> Excuse me. And in addition to them failing to do that, we have now had other partners or entities I would describe as partners step forward, and they are starting to put pressure on Apex as well, and by via of actually filing suit against uh, Apex for failing to maintain the property. So I wanted to share with you who those folks are and what their interests are. <clears throat> Virginia Housing, who used to be uh, the Virginia Housing Development Authority, has an interest in this property that dates back to actually 2003 under the previous owner when uh, they entered into an extended use regulatory agreement uh, with the previous owner in order to provide them with federal low income housing tax credits. Um, as a result of that tax credit program, they were able to get a 
deed restriction uh, posted to the property and the deed of trust uh, that requires that, <coughs> excuse me, requires that uh, the property be maintained suitable for occupancy and free from health and safety hazards. Um, they have their own inspection program to execute that to make sure that the property is being maintained in compliance with federal housing standards in addition to being able to latch on to our notices of violation and our inspection results uh, and cite that as a, as a compliance uh, initiative under their, under their extended use agreement. So they went out and uh, right after Apex acquired the property in 2018, Virginia Housing inspected the property and found it to be in violation of their health and safety um, standards as well as being in violation of not their record keeping requirements of the federal program. Um, and they cited uh, Apex for that violation, but then they were unable to follow through on making uh, Apex respond to that due to COVID restrictions, and COVID shut down their, their ability to perform inspections uh, because the IRS suspended the inspection program. Um, once that um, restriction was lifted by the IRS, uh, Virginia Housing re-engaged the property in March of this year, uh, found the same types of problems that they found in 2018, uh, and they also were aware of our issues and, and concerns and our notices, and they issued a letter to Apex, um, effectively debarring them from participating in any other tax credit program or application uh, within the state. Um, they also issued a debarment letter to the um, Apex's management firm, uh, which was managing the property, known as Aloft Management Company. And they issued a, another letter of noncompliance to them a couple of weeks later in April of 2022, uh, requesting that they be responsive and address the concerns and issues that they had identified with respect to the housing and the improper documentation or record keeping. Uh, Apex, of course, has not responded to that. Uh, and it resulted in um, Virginia Housing filing a lawsuit in the form of an, a petition for an injunction with the circuit court for violating the terms of the extended use agreement. So Virginia Housing, though, has not yet served uh, that court proceeding uh, or that lawsuit uh, on Apex. Um, another third, another party has uh, since stepped forward in that time frame in August and reached out to both Virginia Housing and to us. And that is a company by the name of Argentic Services Company, LP. They are a loan servicer, server. Um, that uh, was engaged uh, as a result of Apex acquiring a loan uh, against the property uh, for $13 million in June of 2021. So, Greg, that is the, um, just so the board is aware, that is a, it's a CMBS, is that the right term? Um, is that right, Eric? Can you come up just for a minute and explain what that means because this is this is key to I think some of the conversations I keep dropping stuff I'm sorry so it's not apex now which has a nationwide history of being a bad player but you now have collateral collateralized security yes um, mr. manager is correct it's a commercial back um, mortgage security so it's essentially a, a loan that's packaged with other loans it could be 10, it could be 20 or 30 um, loans packaged together. Um, Argentic is what's called a special servicer um, that put this, uh, that services the loan and acts in the role of the lender, um, which makes this more complicated than a bank lending to a commercial um, property owner. Um, it's more complicated because there's certain things that have to be done because it's part of that package of loans. Um, it makes it more complicated to go through the process of foreclosing, et cetera. Did that answer your question, Mr. Manager? May I have a question? Yes, question. So they're taking out a loan. Is there any assurances that it, the money would go to Glenwood, or are they, they just using the property as collateral? No, they refinanced this property back in July, right, Mr. Rebels, or June of last year? June 21st of last year. Of last year. So they already have the loan. Um, they initially purchased the property for $8 million. Um, they refinanced in last year in June for $13 million. And a part of that package was that there was a certain reserve that would be used to fix units. 
And to our knowledge, none of that money has been used to fix anything at this particular property. Nothing. The loan holder is Argentic? So they're the ones on the hook? They're the special They wrote a $13 server. million dollar refinancing loan? Yes. No wonder they're interested. And keep in mind, there are investors that are that are investing in these loans. Argentic packaged these loans for them to invest in as a part of that CMBS. Mr. Manager. Mr. Manager, uh, a quasi legal inquiry. If uh, someone wants to build a house in Henrico County. Uh, there are a certain number of codes that they have to follow. And by that same extension, although this may be private property, does the locality have the rights or could it get the rights so that if someone wants to come into that locality to abide by a certain number of guidelines that that locality has? So we are pushing every lever that we have legally and we've actually wandered is, into some territory that's really unknown. Um, I, we have no experience with dealing with CMBS, you know, collateralized bundled securities. So this, this you know, out of town owner was able to leverage money from a, from a bank and take that money, do nothing with it, make, z uh, make no mortgage payments until, and so now the loan servicer is involved trying to get, you know, something out of the, uh, you know, pay the investors back. But as I understand it, this loan is bundled with a series of other loans. Think about the 2008 housing crisis and how that, um, but those loans uh, uh, seem to be in good order. This one seems to be the one that is the problem. So we are literally, I mean, we've talked to everyone from state officials to nonprofits. Glenwood Farms has been a consistent conversation for the county. And it's, it's something to your point, Mr. Thornton, where, you know, we can say, well, it's not really within our realm. You know, we don't have the authority to do any. The only thing we can do is what Greg is doing. And the reality is, if we let Glenwood Farms go, then what have we done? It's a, and I'll say the moral for, from my perspective as the building official and having the responsibility under the rental inspections program to enforce the building code proactively on the property is we, we're now seeing something I've never experienced, which is, uh, third-party entities that have an interest in the property are coming forward, and they're actually using uh, the results of our inspection efforts, our enforcement efforts, our court case efforts to further their causes. So it only puts additional pressure, or as much as we can come to bring to bear, against the property owner uh, from another angle. Uh, Argentic, <clears throat> as the loan servicer, has actually used our um, efforts uh, as a part of the filing that they made in September of this year uh, to place the property into emergency receivership. Um, so they were going to bring in uh, another entity to manage the property, take control of the property away from Apex, uh, and initiate foreclosure of the property so that they could you know, protect their financial interests that went with the loan uh, that was issued in June of 2021. Um, they they actually had <coughs> excuse me a court date set for September the 27th of this year, but they suspended that because for what they told us were productive talks with Apex, and then they came forward in October with the name of an, of an individual um, that that was interested in purchasing the property, but not local. This would have been an entity that was located basically in New York. Um, very near the headquarters of the current owner. Um, and they had no plans to redevelop the property. Um, <clears throat> they were simply going to maintain things that in status quo from best what we could tell. So ultimately that resulted in a conversation uh, between Argenic, the county administration, over the possibility of having a local buyer come in and take over responsibility to property. And the way that would have to work is the same as what Argentic was 
uh, initiating back in their September court case, somebody's going to have to come in and you know buy the note and then follow that same process because they won't by buying the loan they will not maintain ownership of the property. They'll have to go through foreclosure proceedings against Apex in order to actually acquire the property and then implement a, a redevelopment plan. So where we stand at, <coughs> excuse me, at this moment is we have a work group that's been created. They've just started working um, to, that's, that's charged with gaining control of the site, i.e. getting a hold of that note and then being able to go through the receivership process if it's necessary. Um, and ultimately foreclose, take ownership of the property, and redevelop it. Uh, that, that work group we're uh, calling a consortium, and it consists of county representatives, uh, finance, county attorney, Eric, myself, um, local builders and developers uh, who have experience working with this type of property uh, in a property of this size and magnitude to develop a master plan for what it would look like if we could... Uh, make this goal happen, uh, philanthropic par partners, and ultimately people who have worked with communities like this and redeveloped communities like this through engagement with the residents as well to get their input as to what the property should look like going forward. Um, it's very early days, very early uh, stages of this process. Like the manager mentioned at the um, state of the county address, there's no roadmap for this. Uh, there's no guideline for this. We're doing it as we learn it. Um, so um, hopefully it's, a, <clears throat> it's going to be a, a really positive outcome and we'll make good traction over the next few weeks or months. Um, I do want to point out that um, we have been <clears throat> engaging the residents on this property <clears throat> all throughout this process. We've not let them uh, aside. We, we do these inspections for them. We've uh, had several community events. Um, with them last December, uh, we had a food distribution effort that involved multiple agencies within the county, uh, Eric's shop um, and community revitalization, uh, Henrico Fire Department, <coughs> Station 7 staff, uh, as well as some of their administrative folks, uh, Henrico Police, um, the manager's office, <coughs> and as well as Monica uh, really helping us out with uh, the food itself through Feed More and in the Community Food Bank. That was a very successful event that was held last December. Um, we're going to repeat that again in a couple weeks on uh, December 17th because uh, we know these families are stressed even more now with inflation and, and food prices going up. Uh, the police uh, department held a, a chief's walk across the property in April of 2022, also supported by uh, us as, and community revitalization. And we had an event uh, on National Night Out on August the 2nd uh, out at Fire Station 7. We grilled hot dogs and gave them some uh, drinks and chips. And uh, we also had uh, a lot of entertainment out there uh, at the event. That was a real successful effort as well. Um, so we're still engaging the residents. We're also hooking the residents up with or um, giving them access to uh, free legal services through Virginia Legal uh, Aid Society, as well as a couple of uh, private firms that are providing pro bono services to those residents to help them uh, navigate uh, the tenant assertion process as well as the eviction process uh, in protecting their rights and interests. So it's, it's an ongoing project that is not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, question, uh, Madam Chair. I, it may be more so for the manager than um, Mr. Revels. So resident engagement efforts, July 2019, but this started before 2000, July 2019. If I can remember, this goes back. Uh, I just asked the manager a question. It, maybe you can answer it for everybody. The difference between this and a project like St. Luke is, <coughs> if you can answer that, this, so this, this was initially, this was initiated by um, resident concerns, right? We went out and we found so much more um, it, wrong with the property. That's where this all started. And, you know, a lot of, I would assume that other local governments, because technically, like you said, the only tool we really have is what Mr. Revels is doing. Code enforcement. Like we don't, yes, yeah, code enforcement. Right. So it, we are going many, 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 many steps further than we have to go. 
as a government simply because we care about the residents, because that's really what this is about, uh, right. caring for the people who are there. Yeah, absolutely. So just talk about, uh, Mr. Manager, if you don't mind, what's the difference between this and some of the other spots that I've had intervention from the federal government. I was so if we talk about St. Luke's, the question there was there was a lot, there was HUD involvement with St. Luke's with the underlying financing. So ultimately what we were able to do with St. Luke's was have a heavy renovation um, of, the, of all of the units. We added, um, believe it or not, washer and dryers in the units because I think there were eight units that shared a washer dryer. Imagine that. I mean, with kids, and there were 900 kids are uh, in the complex. So with St. Luke's, it was really uh, more about getting one owner out, finding another owner, and having and and helping HUD get to a place where they could help. And that was hard, and it took a while. It took a number of uh, shaming efforts publicly, if you will. What we have, but St. Luke's ultimately could be renovated. This property cannot be renovated. I mean, let's be clear about that. These units that were built in the 1940s systematically need to be rebuilt. And so the county has made a commitment day one that every resident that is in Glenwood Farms, we would find a door-to-door -door approach as far as getting them new housing. Whether that involved, and let me be clear about this, a federal funding source, a state funding source, or even a, a local funding source. We have never done this before. If we can't find a federal voucher and we have a family in need, we will find a way to get that family housing. So we also have made a pledge that we would, or the plan is, subject to board approval, that we would make a contribution to a 501c3 for land. So think of a... Uh, Laura Lafayette's group, county makes a contribution because we can't make a contribution to a private developer to buy down the cost of the land. And then the third lever that we have would be some sort of synthetic uh, TIF for housing. Um, think about a 10-year schedule where we dial back the base value to zero and ultimately allow a developer to come in there and benefit, and we think that could generate significant revenue as well, somewhere between five and seven million dollars. So ultimately, and Joe Emerson has shared that if we were able to, Ms. Thornton, this requires additional density. So on 26 acres, you can put ownership, you can make sure that you have affordable housing, and you can have uh, for rent. Um, uh, income based. And I think the number you had given me, Joe, was north of 700 units. So we have 296 units. You can actually, and so you start to see how with partners, with many partners, and with intent, you can make this happen. But ultimately, job one is to control the land, and the county's not going to be able to do that. So that's where we are. Did I did I state that correctly, Mr. Revels? Yep. Did I answer your question? No, you did. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Lebo. So I know. Come on, Mr. Um, Lebo. What we've talked about so far just takes a different type of philosophy, of leadership, of vision. Et cetera. And most of what we're talking about is humanity. So I just, again, want to thank you, Mr. Manager, and your tremendous team of leaders with all of these different task force and um, synergy with all of the departments that look at stuff from Williamsburg Road to um, Glenwood Farms specifically, but other housing issues. And then when we start looking, we'll talk later about the youth violence. I mean, all of this stuff is about people. And I just think it takes a different type of leadership to want to even engage in that uh, because that's not the easy route to go sometimes. Um, so I just want to tell you thank you. I mean, we really are tackling some difficult stuff. We We could have walked away from this project, to be honest. And maybe no one would have cared outside of people who live there and Mr. Thornton and, you know, um, 
you know, but we continue to wrestle with this project four years later uh, with no answer right now, but we keep on moving it. And that's, I just want to tell you guys, thank you. Madam Chair, if I may, uh, I, I want to also to you guys say keep going, great job. I know it's not easy when it's grounds that not, we have never crossed, but I don't think anyone has ever really crossed. So uh, again, you guys are leading the way. Um, and last comment is the last two topics that we've covered is about people scamming our citizens. How do, and that may be something we need to look at in some sort of ordinance, but to have crooks coming in and taking advantage of Henrico County citizens is in no way all right. So I would challenge the, the different groups that are working on Glenwood and also the revitalization area of, of uh, uh, Williamsburg Road. Um, with those, we, we need to figure out how to make Henrico a safe zone from scammers in regards to this. So, Mr. Manager, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you uh, for that, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Brannon. And um, there we are. So, Ms. Monner shared information related to our increasing senior population as well as increased home sales prices and rents. Mr. Revel talked about the challenges that we're facing at Glenwood Farms and our efforts to address those challenges. Next, I'll share some potential strategies that could create additional housing options for our workforce as well as our increasing senior population. So in terms, of, in terms of creating and preserving housing options for our seniors, which we talked about earlier, um, one recommendation is that we explore ways to help our lower income seniors access the capital they need to maintain their home. Many of them are on fixed incomes. In addition to that, we, as you know, provide federal funds to help homeowners through our homeowner rehabilitation and repair programs that serves low income homeowners, seniors, as well as uh, people with disabilities. We could look at ways to provide additional uh, funding to help people age in place should they choose to do so or uh, help them access other options. And the one way we could do that would be by adding language to our comprehensive plans, goals, objectives, and policies that encourages developers to dedicate at least 10% of their development to housing constructed with universal design features, marketed to seniors, as well as more affordable to seniors in our community to help them with those additional housing options. During our uh, your October work session, I shared information related to, and Ms. Minor alluded to this as well, related to the gap between what members of our workforce earn and the income needed to enter the ownership market. So one thing that we're suggesting that we explore is holding a forum with major employers to share some of the challenges that their employees and our employees face as it relates to purchasing a home in, the, in our region. We think that we could discuss ways that we could all help our workforce enter the home ownership market. And we think the, uh, the employers should look to this as a benefit, as it could serve as a major recruitment and retention tool, similar to a 401k, but the only difference would be that they would reap the benefit of that up front rather than having to wait to retire to reap the benefit of a 401k. So one program that we're suggesting is that we create a program that could help permanent full-time general government and HCPS employees purchase their first home. It could serve, like for the major employers that I talked about, it could serve as a major recruitment and retention tool. We're thinking that we could donate about up to $2 million to a nonprofit to administer this program. We wouldn't administer it in-house. We'd contract with an organization. And we're thinking based on that $2 million donation, we could serve about 120 employees, assuming that an average loan amount is $15,000 and we're paying uh, an administrative fee of $2,000. And that donation would represent about 0.3% of our salary only costs. And just to put that in perspective, we budget about 3.6% in terms of vacancy as it relates to salary only costs. 
the nonprofit, if we go this route, would be responsible for all aspects of program administration that would be from intake to actually um, putting a lien or something to secure investment on the property and then releasing that once the program requirements are met. And that loan, which I've talked about, would be a forgivable loan, non-amortizing. So essentially, as long as that um, purchaser in that household has met the program requirements and purchased a single family attached or detached home in the county or a condominium, they would be eligible to receive the full benefit from that loan. Again, one-fifth of the loan could be forgiven each year. The homeowner, that eligible employee, resides in the home as their primary residence and remains employed within Rico County. I talked about that deed of trust or deed of trust note that would secure the county's investment and would be released um, upon the completion or satisfaction, I should say, of the program requirements. This table here just gives you a general idea of the income limits. And this, these are household limits, not just the employee's income limit, but it would pertain to the entire household for all working individuals. So we're thinking that the loan amount could be increased the lower the AMI of the particular household. So up to 80% AMI could possibly be a $20,000 loan up to 100% of area median income could be a $15,000 loan and up to 120%, possibly a $10,000 loan. And I say up to because one of the things that would be required would be a subsidy layering analysis to make sure that that household is getting what they need to be able to close and afford the home, not more than that. Next, I want to talk about land use and zoning policies. That Hang on, uh, Eric. Yes, sir. Um, Madam Chair, with your indulgence, I'd like the uh, board's feedback on just generally on the thought of what Eric put out. Yeah. I, I've been be, thinking about that. Yeah, this is this would be a major program. It, yes. And I'm certain that many employees would be interested in it. But when you said you'd have to turn it over to a nonprofit, I know that. I mean, the county isn't going to run it, but um, um, and the money would begin with a, um, an uh, amount suggested two million that would go into a pot, right? Yes, it would, okay. go, to it would go to the nonprofit. To, to the nonprofit, excuse me. So this, you're saying, would be a way for employees um, who would want to stay in, with the county to make, after five, oops, after five years, they would have re repaid this loan. Is that correct, too? It's a forgivable loan. So forgivable they don't, loan. They don't make any payments on the loan. The mm -hmm. requirement would be that they remain employed with the county and use the house as their the primary house. residence. So That's they couldn't it. lease the house out or rent it out. They couldn't move and buy another house. If they did that, mm -hmm. then they would not satisfy the program requirements and then would be required to pay some portion of the loan back. So this would be strictly used by Henrico County employees? Yes, workforce. Workforce. General government and schools. And I get the feeling you're thinking of police department, fire department, and teachers. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Well, of course, other employees, too. but Because yes. that's what, the, what we hear a lot is the police officers have to live in another county or the firefighters have to live in um, some other county. And so, other employees live in, in more rural counties mm -hmm. in the area. And go back, Eric. I mean, you're talking, you're, the numbers that were shared <laughs> earlier, no, as far as the number of, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it there would be, so 120. 120 if, and think about, you know, when you go out and you get a mortgage, yeah. the $15,000 is likely to be a component of the down mm -hmm. payment. Definitely. There'll be some other funds. Mm -hmm. But... You know, we went round and round. Do you do this with some sort of lottery? And and you really can't. You have to do it when you buy a house. You have certain a certain amount of time to to do, you know, to buy the house. And so, literally, it would be the it could be the first hundred and twenty that qualify yep. under those income parameters. And and what I'm thinking too is I know that there's probably been an analysis, and I'm sure, certain you know it. Um, when I say the firefighters or police officers or any employee um, goes to another county, what is the um, average? I know the average sale prices in Henrico are higher than, say, Charles City, New Kent. Um, I don't know about Goochland, <laughs> no. but Caroline County and mm -hmm. some outlying areas. And I know we have maps where we've taken where the employees live. Mm -hmm. And um, some are in Middlesex County and Matthews County and this, drive that long This distance. is Henrico County. I know, but this, this would be your house would be in Henrico. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Because we're trying, and the goal then is to have them live in the same community. 
Yes. So you would have criteria, though. What would be the criteria for those 120? Well, they would have to comply with the income requirements. They would have to be in good standing, meaning mm -hmm. they're perform So they would have to be employed at least a minimum of 12 months with the county so they would have a performance appraisal. They'd have to have a, you know, acceptable, uh, more than acceptable or outstanding performance appraisal. So they have to be in good standing. Um, they would have to, again, live in the home. Um, they would have to, you know, be employed with the county um, for at least five years to reap the full benefit of the loan. Because what I've heard from a few of the employees is that um, they could not afford the houses in Henrico with their salary. Mm -hmm. So I assume their spouse or significant other salary would be taken in, in part of this too. So, yes, I mean, ma'am. So all issues, because um, uh, 1,000 square feet. I had last night some questions, not on this, but about the fact that you can't afford a 1,000 square foot house in Henrico unless you make a certain level of salary. So um, 15,000 is... I think this is good, but, well, our houses are, this is just you're trying to make it more affordable, particularly for our employees that are the, the essential employees. Is that the whole idea, or any employee, is that it? It literally is. It's just um, one okay. attempt, I mean, 120. Mm -hmm. The point was 120 versus the, the, the units that, that are needed. Um, there's... It, what what was that number, Eric? Do you 12, recall? 12,000. 12,000. So, okay. mm -hmm. you know, it literally, it's a start. And potentially, uh, um, there <clears throat> the only other locality that I'm aware of that is doing this is Arlington. Is it? Uh, I believe it's uh, Arlington, Loudoun, and there may be one other locality. Yeah. So um, it's a, it's. it's a different approach, but it, it absolutely will work if you can match the employee, you know, the public employee to workforce housing. Mm -hmm. And then you couple that with some of the efforts that you could undertake where you focus on seniors and potentially you start turning that dial. I, and, but I'm just thinking in terms of what several people have told me is that that 1,000 square foot, three bedroom, one bath, one and a half bath, you know, little ranch house or something um, in an adjacent county could be bought for 150 to 175,000, which the bank would loan them the money. But in Henrico, there'd be 250. So, I mean, that's the other flip side of this. I'm still, I'm not sure, you know, how many and how much it takes. You know, the, the amount. I'm Gordon's not going to answer, but go ahead. Did Madam you want Chair, to say, yeah. um, you know, this is, uh, I guess, expressing uh, my view, but uh, this is why. Retreats are so important because the discussion and the efficacy of those discussions is so important. And I won't just say all that to say that um, Bishop Franklin talked about a new mousetrap. And, and most people understand the analogy here. Uh, when we got employees who um, have to struggle for, with, with uh, rent and all of that, and then we can kind of devise a plan. I'm telling you, that is not only efficacious, but it kind of identifies what Henrico represents. And that uh, we say about the Henrico way. Um, and you've heard me express this from time to time, but you know, when you are in leadership position, you have to lead. And I really think this is an impetus towards finding some solution to this problem here. So I just want to uh, compliment uh, the manager and his staff for putting this together. Nothing is perfect, but at least this is a plan. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I think it's going in the leadership position. So that's what we're here for, to see can we improve it, if it needs improvement and all that. But I just want to express this, uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, for me a, a metaphorical flower moment, really, I think. Thank you, sir. And, Did and you have questions? Thank you. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I wanted, I, I was writing notes as, as you were speaking, and you just cleared up most of them. Uh, you know, I, I want to be very conscious that there's rules about someone not taking advantage of the county. Mm -hmm. uh, living there one year and then renting it. Yeah. Uh, that would be 
that would be horrendous for us. And the other one I was concerned about with is retention after we, the person enters into the, the program. Uh, you're going to hear me a bunch of times through the next two days talk about recruitment. And I, I've already talked to the manager about all the, all the things we really need to do to be, be competitive. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, in the world we live in now, it's all about being competitive to get the, the brightest and the best. So uh, I think this is going to be one outstanding recruitment tool. So I'm, I'm, I'm all in. Keep going. Thank you, sir. And I will add that, I mean, a lot of the initiatives you've heard, I mean, I'm here presenting, but there are teams of folks from finance, there are folks from HR, Yvette and Kim and her team. I mean, we're all pulling this information together, putting this forward. So it's a team effort. So next I'll talk about uh, yeah, Lane, 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 Lane. One second. Lane. Mr. Manager, you asked for feedback. I'll offer it in bullet point form. Uh, a couple things I liked about it. 0.3% is that was what reflects of the $2 million. Mm -hmm. That 0.3% of the salary cost, you know, the vacancy, I think it's a good point that Eric included in these slides. 3%, 3.6% is what we figure as a salary cost for vacancy. I mean, that, that's the financial explanation for it. The empathetic, the heart, the Henrico explanation for it is exactly why it's even on these slides and here for discussion today. Yeah. So my feedback is the financial thing has been ans asked and answered before we could even ask it in mm -hmm. Easy form, right? 0.3% of 3.6% is the explanation. Very easy to get to that number, if not more so, if this program becomes a success. That, uh, so I like that piece. I like the five year satisfaction of it remaining a Henrico County employee. I think it's of note, we heard from Sheila a minute ago say that the median price in Henrico has crossed $300,000. Mm -hmm. You know, for someone in Henrico to purchase a $300,000 house, we know the 20% PMI number to get a reasonable mortgage is 20% down payment, 60 grand for that. That's what I mean. Your cost yeah. to acquire with closing costs and real, realtor, and I mean, you're talking about 10 grand in other costs. So that mm -hmm. 10 to 15 to 20,000 is a real number. A couple points I had uh, to Mr. Brand's point, he mentioned a few that I had I crossed off, so I don't want to duplicate it. But another one is this remember, this home doesn't need to be purchased in Henrico, correct? I didn't see anything on that that says they have to live in Henrico. Yes, it would be required. Oh, good. I, that, I was going to ask, that would be an incentive to that. I, I, we want these folks doing that. Yeah, we want to help them purchase a house right here in, in this county. So that I, I'm sorry I missed that on the initial one. Um, you know, and then my last question was if anyone else in the Commonwealth was doing it. You mentioned Arlington, and I, I think, did you mention Loudoun? Mm -hmm. You know, I've, we've had a couple conversations even recently about being the first in the Commonwealth and not to have fear as we do that because we've done it correctly. You know, I don't mind being third in this regard, but uh, we'll do it better than the other two. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, to our folks who want to come to this county and teach, we need to make it as easy as possible to do so. And for those who want to come to this county and work in public safety and work in our Department yeah. of Public Works and General Services, and uh, you know, we need to make it as easy for them to do so. I think we do on so many levels, and this is another one, um, so, Mr. Manager, you asked for feedback. There you have it. I, 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 I couldn't think of another uh, mm -hmm. way to improve an opportunity in this program. I, I just can, can I just add to that? Support. The um, Loudoun and Arlington and Loudoun, they've been doing it for how long? Um, don't know off of the top of my head, okay. but I can get back to you on that. All right, so we don't, you know, just to piggyback off of what Dan said, it's others that have jumped in the deep end before us, so we can just learn from their mistakes mm -hmm. and... Uh, make it better. We haven't, <clears throat> I looked through the book already, so I know what the next few slides are going to be. Um, but it speaks to what my colleague just said about um, teachers, about police officers, about, um, you know, the service jobs that are the backbone of our community. And I think if we can jump out and provide housing, um, you know, I, I really think it'll be a trendsetter for this area. And we probably will be able to um, get some of the better people that we possibly would be losing to other places who could provide more. So, I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. I mean, we have to work through through some of the kinks mm -hmm. if there are kinks. But I mean, this is very Henrico to me. So, thank you. And my comment was, I know I'm going to be stepping out here, but. I'm, my concern is trying to figure out what the cost of the house is going to be and do they qualify for their, with their salary and is this enough <laughs> of help? To me, it, it's looking like it's almost just going to cover closing costs, but 
when you're buying a house, that can be the one step that you really need. So I totally agree that this is obviously a really good step toward being competitive and getting a higher caliber of employee because we'll get more applicants. So that part of it I agree with. I think the only limitation, there is a code limit up to 25000 that okay. you can provide. But well, yeah. well, thank you. No, that helps, too, mm -hmm. for my, in my thinking. I appreciate that. No thank problem. You. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. So next I'll share some ideas that we have in terms of land use and zoning policies. So as you will recall, um, Joe and his team, uh, Mr. Emerson, updated the zoning ordinance in September of 2021. Um, one strategy that we think will prove beneficial is that we could educate the development community regarding the opportunities for greater flexibility that is available in that new ordinance. So really just educating them related to the R6 with the provisional use permit standards. The fact that we removed, excuse me, <coughs> we removed minimum house sizes from the code so that uh, builders can build smaller houses, which we would hope to translate into uh, greater levels of affordability educating them in terms of the housing types that are allowed within our, uh, our existing districts. And then just thinking of the residential districts with smaller lot sizes, so the R3A, the R4, and the R4A lots that could lend themselves to greater levels of affordability, just making our development community and building community aware of those options. Also, um, we could work with the development community um, and create a policy that allows them to proffer conditions that would allow them to create workforce housing or senior housing within their developments. And we're thinking that for home ownership developments, developers could agree to make homes perpetually affordable using the com community land trust model, or for rental developments, we could encourage them to utilize the increased flexibility through the zoning ordinance to provide units at a lower price point for folks earning 80% area median income. And that's about 80000 500 for a family of four, or household of four. Question. Um, yes, sir. Mr. Manager, Mr. Lebo, will any of this con conflict with um, whatever the governor is bringing forward? No, I mean, it could be a good guide for the governor, actually. Okay. We don't have anything that um, tangible. We don't have a bill yet, just rhetoric. Right. But, I mean... They can they can absolutely use some of this. So this is something though that we would have to get approval from the state to do. No, 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 not at all. No, no, no. Okay. And it's already been done, Mr. Uh, Nelson. So oh, you yes. remember the Fulton yeah. Yard development? Um, the developer proffered that 10% of those units would be rented to folks at 80% below um, at rates that are 20% below their market rents. So it's already been done in Henrico. So we're thinking that there may be other developers that or uh, property owners that would be willing and they're interested in doing the right thing in terms of providing some affordability. And we're not talking 100%, but some smaller percentages of affordability within their developments because it's just the right thing to do. They're seeing the same numbers that we're looking at. They know the need is there. So let's help them get there. I have a question, though, about there were two things here. The um, not, not indicating minimum house size. This is their current minimum 900 square feet? There are no current minimum. There are no current minimums. Understand that those were removed from the ordinance. Is that correct? Right. No? Okay, I knew you know that, Mr. Emerson. Um, smaller lot sizes, do we already have a minimum of smaller lot sizes? We have three that were reintroduced with the zoning ordinance update. I'll actually Mr. Emerson? Covered it already, Mr. Lebo. Uh, Ms. O'Bannon, you'll mm -hmm. recall in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, the board <laughs> removed from the code the R3A, the R4, the R4A lots. Mm -hmm. So with the update, we added back in the R3A, the R4, and the R4A lots. So you now have three new categories okay. of uh, smaller lots that are available. You also have several new planned development districts that allow a developer to come in and master plan a development similar to a proposal that's occurring in Verona right now where they have the ability to come in and within their terms and conditions set forth the size of lot that they will have in that community to fit some of the house sizes that they're proposing okay. and to make better use of land. So, so we do have that. Well, because I'm familiar with um, an eighth of an acre, you can get about, you know, six or eight houses a, a single family, very nice size houses. They're 2,200 square feet, um, two stories. 
on an eighth of an acre, and I do not recall zonings where we've had single-family detached homes with garages on eighth of an acre lots. Do you know of any development that's on an eighth of an acre like that? The ones I'm talking about are in Maryland, but I've, I've been dri I drive through a lot of places, believe it or not, just to look at. What I don't they think look we like. have anything that hits quite that small. We've okay. got our R five A lots that mm -hmm. uh, that are what 5,600 square feet, I believe, right. and uh, those do hold a a single fa large single family home. You've got examples of that all over the county, probably in excess of 4,000 square feet with a garage on those lots. Okay, thank you. One, one thank more question, sorry. Uh -huh. um, I don't know who this is for, but I know we were talking about using this as a recruiting tool. What about um, employees that have been around for a while? I mean, that's just throwing it out. Let, yeah. Let's say it's a, a teacher, older teacher, been around for a couple of decades. It'd be open to all of them. Yeah, okay. recruiting oh, and not, retention. Not just, okay, recruiting and, and retention. retention. Yeah. So keeping all right, perfect. good employees. Yes, okay, sir. perfect. Thank you, Mr. Emerson. The next, uh, one of the other strategies that we're suggesting is really educating. So a part of the zoning ordinance update, uh, we uh, put into place the ability to create an accessory dwelling unit. And one of the things that we think could lend itself to creating greater levels of affordability within the county would be to increase marketing efforts to make more developers and homeowners aware of the option. And then in addition to that, developing material, materials that better explain the process to help people navigate how do they create that accessory unit that could lend itself to some greater level of affordability for the, the person that lives in the unit. Lastly, um, we could require the inclusion of senior and workforce housing and developments that seek board approval for revitalization area designation. And this is required when developers are seeking financing through Virginia Housing or any other financing related approvals that they may come to the county um, board for. And last but not least, through our Henrico Next 2045 Comprehensive Plan, ensure the inclusion of objectives pertaining to the promotion of senior and workforce housing. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to try and answer any questions you all may have. Any questions from members of the board? Well, we're now through the... Oh, okay. So are you going to do that? All right. We're going to take another five-minute break. Thank you.